We are controlled by what we focus on and what things mean. But the problem is most of us have been conditioned and we let the world and the environment train us to think like everybody else. And listen, you and I both know, I'm not, I'm not into positive thinking. I'm into the truth. I'm into intelligence. I'm into seeing it as is, but not worse than it is. I'm into seeing it better than it is. So there's a vision. Otherwise you have no direction. And then I'm into doing what it takes to turn it around. See, you've got to control the meaning. If you control the meaning, you have an extraordinary life. But if you let the media, external people, then you'll be a follower. And most people, you tell me, are most Americans healthy, vital, strong, healthy? Are most Americans in a passionate relationship for decades where they don't just hang out, they love each other and want to be with each other? Do most people have a career or a job or a company that they love, can't wait to go to every day? You know, the answer is most people, the answer is no. But there's a few who do. And I mentioned a few who do versus the many who talk. And then finally, the third decision is what are you going to do? Because what you're going to do is different than if your meaning is they're dissing me, than if your meaning is they're challenging me, than if their meaning is they're loving on me. Does it make sense? And so it's important to learn to find empowering meanings, to train yourself to focus on what you have what, instead of what's missing, what you can do, what you can do this moment, what you can do in the future. Those are just a couple samples. And if you do that, you're going to be in a state where you're going to know what to do or you're going to learn what to do quickly. And if you don't know what to do, trust your gut and take some kind of action. You go, what if it's the wrong action? You'll find out quicker and you can change again. But if you sit on the fence doing nothing, it'll just create frustration or fear anxiety. So as you go through your graduation today, remember, it's in your moments of decision that your destiny is shaped. So choose well. And as you do, Choose in a way where you're kind to yourself and kind to others and where you trust that there's something in you larger than your mind. There's a spirit and soul inside you that can guide you. You can ask for that guidance and you can trust in that guidance. And that does not mean you're always going to make the right choice, but it does mean that you can learn from everything. And in the end, life's not about just being happy, right? The moment, if you're happy all the time, your face hurts. <laughs> you know, if you're smiled so much for so much, your face hurts. We need a balance. What we really need is a life of meaning. And that's a life where it's not just about you. It's a life of service. If you can find something or someone that you care so much for, you'll do anything for them, then the greatest part of you will come out. It could be a mission for your community. It could be for the world. It could be your family. It could be your friends. It could be your lover. It could be anything. Could be in the future, maybe your children. But if you can find something you care about more than yourself, you're not going to suffer. Because in the end, there's only two options, suffer or grow. If you're suffering, you haven't grown yet. And so grow into a new set of beliefs that take you beyond the focus of limitation to what's truly possible. So congratulations. This is a beautiful day. Even though it may be challenging in all kinds of ways, remember, you know, we're the opponent what creates a great hero. And you've got a great story to write in the life of your life. You've already written a beautiful story to start with, but I really trust and send prayers and faith and love that you have create the most compelling future possible and that you build a life that is truly magnificent on your terms. Lead, don't follow. God bless and live with passion. If this body is dying and you can make peace with that, is, it, is this you? Is this who you really are? And then it opens up the question, who are you really? Are you this body? This body every seven years changes. You know, the cells change every seven years, regenerate. So literally after seven years, you have a totally different body, a totally different cellular structure. Technically you are a different person. And so are you just this body? Are you just your past? Are you just your memory? Are, you know, what am I? Who am I? And so I think this is the question. And so for me, death, the real death is not just the death of this physical body, because I believe that what we are is not just this body. We are something more than this physical body. Uh, I think the real death is the letting go of the attachment and the identification of this conditioned sense of self that we have learned to be based on our past,
based on our experiences, based on our childhood, based on our conditioning, based on what our parents told us. You're this kind of person. You're not this kind of person. You'll, you know, you'll never make it. You're stupid. You're amazing. You're great. You're, you're not good at math. You're not a creative person. And so we identify with these thought forms and we identify with these belief systems and then we hold tightly onto this sense of, you know, identification as a sense of me. And so really, I like to question people and ask you, like, is who you are who you really are? You look at a child, a child is in touch with its innocence. A child is in touch with his or her aliveness. It's, it will dance naked. It's not thinking, am I fat? What do you think? You know, it's just, it's just, that's freedom. You know, that's liberation. That's freedom. They're in touch with, you know, I like to call it the divine, you know, their essence, their soul. There's a free expansiveness that they're in touch with. But what happens? You know, we're born into a world where we meet our parents, you know, and our parents, <laughs> they're just doing the best that they can do based on their past and their conditioning and their childhood and their traumas and just their life. And so we're born into this experience. And as children, we learn two things. The first thing is we learn all sorts of ways, often unconsciously out of survival to shut down, disconnect, not feel. Not feel the pain of, my dad's an alcoholic. Not feel the pain of, my dad is not around. Not feel the pain of, my mother's, my mother's crazy or my parents are screaming all the time. As children, we're very sensitive to this. And so we learn all sorts of ways to shut down our feeling capacity to disconnect and we start suppressing, suppressing our feeling and our emotion and our sensitivity just to ultimately function and survive. And then we learn all sorts of ways to sort of go into the world. Me personally, I became the preacher's kid. I became the nice guy. I became the perfect son, I, the perfect person who couldn't make any mistakes. I became the responsible one, which was the over-responsible one. So we learn to develop all of these roles, you know, that we, we kind of suppress our feelings and our pain and we develop all these roles to ultimately function and survive so we contort ourselves into a certain shape to avoid pain, to get love and validation and approval. We contour ourselves into a certain shape and then we identify with the shape that we've become thinking, this is just who I am. And now we're so identified with this as me, but it's simply a conditioned sense of self. And so the more tightly we're holding on to this way of being because maybe it worked for us when we were five. It worked for us when we were eight. It worked for us when we were 10. But maybe it doesn't work for us when we're 22 or 25 or 27 or 30 or whatever the age is, you know. So often what worked for us when we were younger doesn't work for us as we're older. And so I think the degree to which we're identified as the sense of self is inhibits our sense of freedom, inhibits our sense, uh, our ability, many people, we feel like that we have so much potential, you know? I think there's many folks listening in that they feel, we feel like, God, there's so much I want to give. There's so much I want to love. There's so much I want to do and express, but it doesn't get out because it's trapped inside of this sort of identification and these patterns of conditioning. So for me, I think one of the things that keeps us stuck on a, in a simple level uh, are all the ways we lie to ourselves. You know, all the ways we bullshit ourselves, all the ways we don't tell the truth to ourselves, all the ways we rationalize, you know. Uh, you know, I'm in a relationship and it, it, it's not so bad. It, it's okay. I should be grateful, you know. I, and, and, the, and the truth is, we know it's not aligned. Or maybe someone's working a job that they deeply hate inside where they're compromising their integrity, but they're, they're afraid of how am I gonna survive if I'm really honest. What it takes today to live a healthy, a long and healthy life, um, it's so multifaceted. Uh, and nutrition is definitely, it plays a major, a major role in that regard, but it's just one part of the puzzle. And so whereas Genius Foods, my first book, I consider to be sort of the ultimate nutritional care manual for the human brain, um, having a brain that functions as well as it ought to requires a lot more than just healthy eating today, unfortunately. Mm. I mean, I wish it was as easy as eating, you know, a handful of blueberries and wild salmon and, uh, you know, some nuts here and there. But actually, you know, the modern world is sort of like the Hunger Games for, <laughs> for the human brain. And I know you love the movie references. And uh, we're just like, we're being attacked from every which way. From, you know, the, 
the industrial chemicals which we are confronted with on a daily basis, many of which we've we've been exposed to for the entirety of our lives, to the fact that you know leisure time physical activity is at an all time low, to the fact that our food supply has become saturated with ultra processed foods, to the fact that our circadian clocks are completely out of whack. So the genius life, I really explore all of the facets of what it takes to live uh, healthy. I include nutrition and diet as well. Um, but it's really packed with sort of the, the little changes that you can make in your day to day life that are going to have big wins in terms of your health. Mm. When you were doing the research, what was something that really surprised you? Well, I think it was kind of, uh, you know, it, it was scary the degree to which um, the odds are stacked against the average human. And, and that was very eye opening. But it was also simultaneously. What stacks the odds against us? Well, just the fact that. You know, whether it's access to healthy food or air pollution or, you know, the industrial chemicals that we use to clean or even create our domiciles, you know, our, our homes. Um, we're just we're inundated with with exposures that are not doing our biology any favors. Um, so those are the that's what I mean. I mean, today uh, it's it's frightening when you look around, you see people that are, you know, struggling with overweight with being obese. Um, 66% of the population is either overweight or obese. Half of the population is either pre-diabetic or has type 2 diabetes, which we know both of those conditions is actually a late marker for chronically elevated insulin or hyperinsulinemia, mm. um, which can go on for years, if not decades, before your blood sugar actually starts to inch up, you know, to a degree that a doctor would measure it. Um, so, you know, People are not well. Um, if you live to the age of 85, you have a one in two chance of being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Um, certain cancers are increasing in their frequency. In the 1960s, a woman's lifetime risk of developing breast cancer uh, was one in 20. Today, it's about one in eight. So there's obviously been a mutation in our environments. Our genes haven't changed all that much. And yet the default state for any organism is health. But you look around and people are not healthy. People are not feeling well. When you look in the mirror, I mean, I want your listeners to kind of introspect for a minute and ask whether or not you feel healthy, whether or not you feel virile and vital and well. And I wrote this book and I became obsessed with, with this topic and really communicating this message to any, anybody who will listen ultimately because my mom was so sick. Mm -hmm. And I feel in many ways that she was the canary in the coal mine for the modern way of life. I never look at it as investments, believe it or not. Uh, I just look at it as partnerships, help changing the world, and just being part of something that's inspiring. My business people all the time, whenever they talk about money, you can ask them, ah, I don't want to hear it. But if they bring an idea to me that I think is going to go to the next level, most of the time if I follow my heart, and everything else will fall in place. I've never, ever done a deal, A, we got this suit company, we throw some pinstripes in the suit, you give me 100000 we sell 20 of them, we make. I've never did a deal where it was always based on money. I've always did my business deals based on how I felt it was going to go in the future, how I felt it was going to help and inspire somebody. If I look at what Amazon was able to do 20 years ago, we didn't have to build a transportation network. It already existed. That heavy lifting was in place. We didn't have to build a payment system. That heavy lifting had already been done. It was the credit card system. We didn't have to build, um, put a computer at every desk. That had already been done too, mostly for playing games, by the way, and so on. So all the pieces of heavy lifting were already in place 20 years ago. And that's why, as a, with a million dollars, I could start this company. Today, you know, and, and then there are even better examples on the internet over the last 20 years. You know, uh, Facebook started in a dorm room. Uh, I guarantee you, two kids cannot build a giant space company in their dorm room. Don't be so con concerned about what you're going to do with those people, but you want to, you know, the joint brain is, you know, there's nothing the joint brain, collective brain or brains can't overcome. And I give the example of the uh, atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project and they were put together uh, and they were told we need, uh, we need to develop a weapon of mass destruction, which they didn't call it that back in those days, uh, in the middle 40s, to end the war in the Pacific. Uh, and they did. They didn't know if it was implode or explode, but they did. But if, you're, if, if your team doesn't look like that, then you should, I won't say you should give serious thought, you should just change. 
how much exposure is it? Like Tyler will tell you, sitting right here, one of the only times I still do free work is if it's massive exposure. There are 49,000 people in the audience. I'm like, oh, it's a lot of exposure. You know, like, <laughs> like it's live on, you know, it's during the Super Bowl. Like, like I'll pay somebody to put me in a Super Bowl commercial, right? Like it, when, they, when, yeah. when I get exposure or, and that's where I'm at now, in the, for you, when you pick these five restaurants, let it be the biggest restaurants in your 30 mile radius. Let it be the kindest. Let it be somebody who has the biggest Instagram following and maybe like whether, you know, you never want to give with expectation but it's, it's okay to ask. You're like, hey, I'd love to sharpen your knives for free. The nature of capitalism is that people want to come in and take your castle, perfectly understandable. I mean, if I'm selling television sets or something, there's gonna be 10 other people that are gonna try and sell a better television set. If I have a restaurant here in Omaha, people are gonna try and copy my menu and give more parking and take my chef and so on. So capitalism's all about somebody coming and trying to take the castle. Now what you need is you need a castle that has some durable competitive advantage, some castle that has a moat around it. And that moat, best, one of the best moats in many respects is to be a low cost producer. But sometimes the moat is just having more talent. I mean, if you're the heavyweight champion of the world and you keep knocking out people, you've got a competitive advantage as long as you can keep doing it. And it's very profitable uh, if you're the one that happens to be able to do it. If you can turn out great motion pictures, I mean, you know, Steven Spielberg, I mean, he, he, he's a fellow to bet on and, and it has enormous economic value.